Kim by Roger Kipling. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Kim by Roger Kipling. Read by Adrian Pretzelis. Chapter 9, Part 2. They were a most mad ten days, but Kim enjoyed himself too much to reflect on their craziness. In the morning they played the jewel game, sometimes with veritable stones, sometimes with piles of swords and daggers, sometimes with photographs of natives. Through the afternoons he and the Hindu boy would mount guard in the shop, sitting dumb behind a carpet bale or a screen, and watching Mr. Lurgan's many and very curious visitors. There were small Rajas, escorts coughing in the veranda, who came to buy curiosities, such as phonographs and mechanical toys. There were ladies in search of necklaces, and men, it seemed to Kim, but his mind may have been vitiated by early training, in search of the ladies. Natives from independent and feudatory courts whose ostensible business was the repair of broken necklaces, rivers of light poured out upon the table, but whose true end seemed to be to raise money for angry Maharanis or young Rajas. There were Babus whom Lurgan Sahib talked with austerity and authority, but at the end of each interview he gave them money in coined silver and currency and currency notes. There were occasional gatherings of long-coated theatrical natives who discussed metaphysics in English and Bengali, to Mr. Lorgan's great edification. He was always interested in religions. At the end of the day Kim and the Hindu boy, whose name varied at Lorgan's pleasure, were expected to give a detailed account of all that they had seen and heard. Their view of each man's character, as shown in his face, talk, and manner, and their notions of his real errand. After dinner Lurgan Sahib's fancy turned more to what might be called dressing up, in which game he took a most informing interest. He could paint faces to a marvel with a brush-dab here and a line there, changing them past recognition. The shop was full of all manner of dresses and turbans, and Kim was apparelled variously as a young Mohammedan of good family, an oil man, and once, which was a joyous evening, as the son of an old landowner, in the fullest of full dress. Lugan Sahib had a hawk's eye to detect the least flaw in the make-up, and lying in a worn teak-wood couch would explain by the half-hour together how such and such a cast talked, or walked, or coughed, or spat, or sneezed, and since hows matter little in this world, the why of everything. The Hindu child played this game clumsily. That little mind, keen as an icicle where tally of jewels was concerned, could not temper itself to enter another's soul. But a demon in Kim woke up and sang with joy as he put on the changing dresses and changed speech and gesture therewith. Carried away by enthusiasm, he volunteered to show Lurgan Sahib one evening how the disciples of a certain caste of fakir, old Lahore acquaintances, begged doles by the roadside, and what sort of language he would use to an Englishman, to a Punjabi farmer going to a fair, and to a woman without a veil. Lurgan Sahib laughed immensely, and begged Kim to stay as he was, immobile, for half an hour, cross-legged, ash-smeared, and wild-eyed in the back room. At the end of that time entered a hulking, obese babu, whose stockinged legs shook with fat, and Kim opened on him with a shower of wayside chaff. Lurgan Sahib, uh, this annoyed Kim, watched the babu, and not the play. "'I think,' said the babu, heavily, lighting a cigarette, I am of opinion that it is most extraordinary and efficient performance. Except that you had told me I should have opined that, that, that you were pulling my legs. How soon can he become approximately efficient chain man? Because then I shall indent for him. That is what he must learn at Lucknow. 
Then order him to be jolly damn quick. Good night, Lurgum. The Babu swung out with the gait of a bogged cow. When they were telling over the day's list of visitors, Lurgan Sahib asked Kim who he thought the man might be. "'God knows,' said Kim cheerily. The tone might almost have deceived Mahbub Ali, but it failed entirely with the healer of sick pearls. "'That is true. God he knows. But I wish to know what you think.' Kim glanced sideways at his companion, whose eye had a way of compelling truth. "'I think—I—I I think he will want me when I come from the school, but—' Confidentially, as Lurgan Sahib nodded approval, "'I do not understand how he can wear many dresses and talk many tongues.' "'Thou wilt understand many things later. He is a writer of tales for a certain colonel. His honour is great only in Simla.' and it is noticeable that he has no name, but only a number and a letter. That is a custom among us. And is there a price upon his head, too, as upon ma all the others? Not yet. But if a boy rose up who is now sitting here and went—look, the door is open—as far as a certain house, with a red-painted veranda behind that which was the old theatre in the lower bazaar, and whispered through the shutters, Hari Chanda Mukherjee bore the bad news of last month. That boy might take away a belt full of rupees. How many? said Kim promptly. Five hundred? A thousand? As many as he might ask for. Good. And for how long might such a boy live after the news was told? He smiled merrily at Logan Sahib's very beard. Ah, that is well thought of. Perhaps, if he were very clever, he might live out the day, but not the night, by no means the night. Then what is the Babu's pay if so much is put upon his head? Eighty, perhaps a hundred, perhaps a hundred and fifty rupees. But the pay is the least part of the work. From time to time God causes men to be born, and thou art one of them who have a lust to go abroad at the risk of their lives and discover news. Today it may be of far-off things, tomorrow of some hidden mountain, and the next day of some nearby men who have done a foolishness against the State. These souls are very few, and of these few not more than ten are of the best. Among these ten I count the Babu, and that is curious. How great, therefore, and desirable must be a business that brazens the heart of a Bengali. True, but the days go slowly for me. I am yet a boy, and it is only within two months I learned to write Angrizi. Even now I cannot read it well. And there are yet years and years and long years before I can be even a chain man. Have patience, friend of all the world. Kim startled at the title. Would I had a few of the years that irk thee so! I have proved thee in several small ways. This will not be forgotten when I make my report to the Colonel Sahib. Then, changing suddenly into English, with a deep laugh, By Jove, O'Hara, I think there is a great deal in you, and you must not become proud, and you must not talk. You must go back to Lucknow and be a good little boy and mind your book, as the English say. And perhaps next holidays, if you care, you can come back to me. Kim's face fell. Oh, I mean, if you like. I know where you want to go. Four days later, a seat was booked for Kim and his small trunk at the rear of a Kalkatonga. His companion was the whale like Babu, who, with a fringed shawl wrapped round his head and his fat openwork stockinged left leg tucked under him, shivered and grunted in the morning chill. "'How comes it that this man is one of us?' thought Kim, considering the jelly back as they jolted down the road, and the reflections threw himself into most pleasant daydreams. Lurgan Sahib had given him five rupees, a splendid sum, 
as well as the assurance of his protection if he worked. Unlike Mahbub, Logan Sahib had spoken most explicitly of the reward that would follow obedience, and Kim was content. If only, like the Babu, he could enjoy the dignity of a letter and a number, and a price upon his head. Some day he would be all that and more. Some day he might be almost as great as Mahbub Ali. The housetops of his search should be half India. He would follow kings and ministers, as in the old days he followed vakils and lawyers' touts across Lahore City for Mahbub Ali's sake. Meantime there was the present, and not at all unpleasant, fact of St. Xavier's immediately before him. There would be new boys to condescend to, and there would be tales of holiday adventures to hear. Young Martin, son of the tea-planter at Manipur, had boasted that he would go to war with a rifle against the head-hunters. That might be, but it was certain that young Martin had not been blown half across the forecourt of a Patiala palace by an explosion of fireworks. Nor had he— Kim fell to telling himself the story of his own adventures through the last three months. He could paralyze St. Xavier's, even the biggest boys who shaved, with the recital— were that permitted? But it was, of course, out of the question. There would be a price upon his head in good time, as Logan Sahib had assured him, and if he talked foolishly now, not only would that price never be set, but Colonel Crichton would cast him off, and he would be left to the wrath of Logan Sahib and Mahbub Ali for the short space of life that would remain to him. So I should choose Delhi for the sake of a fish— was his proverbial philosophy. It behooved him to forget his holidays. There would always remain the fun of inventing imaginary adventures, and, as Lurgan Saib had said, to work. Of all the boys hurrying back to St. Xavier's from Sakur in the sands of Gali beneath the palms, none was so full with virtue as Kimbal O'Hara, gigoting down to Ambala, behind Hari Chandar Mukherjee, whose name on the books of one section of the ethnological survey was R-17. And if additional spur were needed, the Babu supplied it. After a huge meal at Kalka, he spoke uninterruptedly. Was Kim going to school? Then he, an M.A. of Calcutta University, would explain the advantages of education. There were marks to be gained by due attention to Latin, and Wordsworth excursion. All this was Greek to Kim. French, too, was vital, and the best was to be picked up at Chandanagur, a few miles from Calcutta. Also a man might go far, as he himself had done, by strict attention to plays called Lear and Julius Caesar, both much in demand by examiners. Lear was not so full of historical allusions as Julius Caesar. The book cost four annas, and could be bought second-hand in Bow Bazaar for two. Still, more importantly than Wordsworth, or the eminent authors Burke and Hare, was the art and science of mensuration. A boy who had passed his examination in these branches, for which, by the way, there were no cram-books, could, by merely marching over a country with a compass and a level and a straight eye, carry away a picture of that country which might be sold for large sums in coined silver. But as it was occasionally inexpedient to carry about measuring chains, a boy would do well to know the precise length of his own foot-pace, so that when he was deprived of what Hari Chanda called adventitious aids, he might still tread his distances. To keep count of thousands of paces, Hari Chandra's experience had shown him nothing more valuable than a rosary of eighty-one or a hundred and eight beads, for it was divisible and subdivisible into many multiples and sub-multiples. Through the volleying drifts of English, Kim caught the general trend of the talk, and it interested him very much. Here was a new craft that a man could tuck away in his head and by the look of the large, wide world unfolding itself before him, it seemed the more a man knew, the better for him. Said the Babu, when he had talked for an hour and a half, 
I hope some day to enjoy your official acquaintance. Ad interim, if I may be pardoned that expression, I shall give you this beetle-box, which is highly valuable article and cost me two rupees only four years ago. It was a cheap, heart-shaped thing, with three compartments for carrying the eternal betel-nut, lime, and pan leaf, but it was filled with little tabuloid bottles. That is reward of merit for your performance in character of that holy man. You see, you are so young you think you will last for ever, and not take care of your body. It is great nuisance to go sick in the middle of business. I am fond of drugs myself, and they are handy to cure poor people, too. These are good departmental drugs, quinine and so on. I give it to you for souvenir. Now, good-bye. I have urgent private business here by the roadside. He slipped out noiselessly as a cat on the Umbala road, hailed a passing cart, and jingled away, while Kim, tongue-tied, twiddled the brass beetle-box in his hands. The record of a boy's education interests few save his parents, and, as you know, Kim was an orphan. It is written in the books of St. Xavier's in Partibus that a report of Kim's progress was forwarded at the end of each term to Colonel Crichton and to Father Victor, from whose hands duly came the money for his schooling. It is further recorded in the same books that he showed a great aptitude for mathematical studies as well as map-making and carried away a prize, the life of Lord Lawrence, tree-calf, two vols, nine rupees, eight annas, for proficiency therein. And the same term played in the St. Xavier's Eleven against the Alagur Mohammedan College, his age being fourteen years and ten months. He was also re-vaccinated, from which we may assume that there had been another epidemic of smallpox at Lucknow about the same time. Pencil notes in the edge of an old muster-roll recall that he was punished several times for conversing with improper persons, and it seems that he was once sentenced to heavy pains for absenting himself for a day in the company of a street beggar. That was when he got over the gate and pleaded with the lama through a whole day down the banks of the Gumpti to accompany him on the road next holidays, for one month for a little week, and the lama set his face as a flint against it, averring that the time had not yet come. Kim's business, said the old man, as they ate cakes together, was to get all the wisdom of the sahibs, and then he would see. The hand of friendship must in some way have averted the whip of calamity, for six weeks later Kim seems to have passed an examination in elementary surveying with great credit, his age being fifteen years and eight months. From this date the record is silent. His name does not appear in the year's batch of those who entered the subordinate survey of India, but against it stands the words, Removed on Appointment. Several times in those three years, cast up at the temple of the Tirthankars in Benares, the lama, a little thinner and a shade yellower, if that were possible, but gentle and untainted as ever. Sometimes it was from the south that he came, from south of Tutikorin, whence the wonderful fire-boats go to Ceylon, where are priests who know Pali. Sometimes it was from the wet green west, and the thousand cotton-factory chimneys that rim Bombay. And once from the north, where he had doubled back eight hundred miles to talk for a day with the keeper of the images in the wonder-house. He would stride to his cell in the cool, cut marble—the priests of the temple were good to the old man—wash off the dust of travel, make prayer, and depart for luck now, well accustomed now to the ways of the rail, in a third-class carriage. Returning, it was noticeable, as his friend the keeper pointed out to the head priest, that he ceased for a while to mourn the loss of his river, or to draw wondrous pictures of the wheel of life but preferred to talk of the beauty and wisdom of a certain mysterious chela, whom no man of the temple had ever seen. Yet he had followed the traces of the blessed feet throughout all India. 
the curator has still in his possession a most marvellous account of his wanderings and meditations. There remained nothing more in life but to find the river of the arrow. Yet it was shown to him in his dreams that it was a matter not to be undertaken with any hope of success unless that seeker had with him one chela appointed to bring the event to a happy issue and versed in great wisdom, such wisdom as the white-haired keeper of images possess. For example, here came out the snuff-gourd, and the kindly Jane priests made haste to be silent. Long and long ago, when Devadatta was king of Benares, let all listen to the Jataka. An elephant was captured for a time by the king's hunters, and ere he broke free, be ringed with a grievous leg iron. Still, this he strove to remove with hate and frenzy in his heart, and hurrying up and down the forests, besought his brother elephants to wrench it asunder. One by one, with their strong trunks, they tried and failed. At the last, they gave it as their opinion that the ring was not to be broken by any bestial power. And in a thicket, new-born, wet with the moisture of birth, lay a day-old calf of the herd, whose mother had died. The fetid elephant, forgetting his own agony, said, If I do not help this suckling, it will perish under our feet. So he stood above the young thing, making his legs buttresses against the uneasy moving herd, and he begged milk of a virtuous cow. And the calf throve, and the ringed elephant was the calf's guide and defence. Now the days of an elephant, let all listen to the Jataka, are thirty-five years to his full strength, and through thirty-five reigns the ringed elephant befriended the younger, and all the while the fetter ate into the flesh. Then one day the young elephant saw the half-buried iron, and turning to the elder said, What is this? It is even my sorrow, said he who had befriended him. Then that other put out his trunk, and in the twinkling of an eyelash abolished the ring, saying, The appointed time has come. So the virtuous elephant, who had waited temperately and done kind acts, was relieved at the appointed time, by the very calf whom he had turned aside to cherish. Let all listen to the Jataka, for the elephant was Ananda, and the calf that broke the ring was none other than the Lord himself. Then he would shake his head benignly, and over the ever-clicking rosary point out how free that elephant calf was from the sin of pride. He was as humble as a chela, who, seeing his master sitting in the dust outside the gates of learning, overleapt the gates, though they were locked, and took his master to his heart in the presence of the proud-stomached city. Rich would be the reward of such a master and such a chela when the time came for them to seek freedom together. So did the lama speak, coming and going across India as softly as a bat. A sharp-tongued old woman in a house among the fruit-trees behind Saranapur honoured him as the woman honoured the prophet. But his chamber was by no means upon the wall. In an apartment of the forecourt, overlooked by cooing doves, he would sit, 
while she laid aside her useless veil and chattered of spirits and fiends of Kulu, of grandchildren unborn, and of the free-tongued brat who had talked to her in the resting place. Once, too, he strayed alone from the Grand Trunk Road below Umbala to the very village whose priest had tried to drug him. But the kind heaven that guards lamas sent him at twilight through the crops, absorbed and unsuspicious, to the Rissaldar's door. Here was like to have been a grave misunderstanding, for the old soldier asked him why the friend of the stars had gone that way only six days before. "'That may not be,' said the lama. "'He has gone back to his own people.' "'He sat in that corner telling a hundred merry tales five nights ago,' his host insisted. "'True, he vanished somewhat suddenly in the dawn after foolish talk with my granddaughter. He grows apace, but he is the same friend of the stars as brought me true word of the war. Have ye parted?' "'Yes and no,' the lama replied. "'We we have not altogether parted, but the time is not ripe that we should take the road together. He acquires wisdom in another place. We must wait.' "'All one. But if it were not the boy, how did he come to speak so continually of thee?' "'And what said he?' asked the lama eagerly. Sweet words, an hundred thousand, that thou art his father and mother, and such all. Pity that he does not take the queen's service. He is fearless. This news amazed the lama, who did not then know how religiously Kim kept to the contract made with Mahbub Ali, and perforce ratified by Colonel Crichton. There is no holding the young pony from the game said the horse-dealer, when the colonel pointed out that vagabonding over India in holiday time was, was absurd. "'If permission be refused to go and come as he chooses, he will make light of the refusal. Then who is to catch him? Colonel Sahib, only once in a thousand years is a horse born so well fitted for the game as this our colt. And we need men.'" End of chapter 9